CRISPR is a technique for altering the human genome. It might be the most powerful tool for biological modification that we have ever discovered. In this episode, we explore CRISPR, how it works, why it exists in the natural world, and the implications of being able to modify DNA so easily. Jeff Ralston is a partner at Y Combinator. He wrote an article entitled Hacking DNA, the story of CRISPR, Ken Johnson, and the gene drive. And since Jeff is not a biologist himself, he's actually the perfect person to explain CRISPR to an audience of non-biologists. Jeff comes from an engineering and computer science background. And since he's an investor, he's also great at explaining the pace at which CRISPR might make it to market and how it might converge with some of the other futuristic trends that we are seeing so regularly today. It's a really exciting conversation I had with Jeff and really enjoyable. Um, If you're interested in hosting a show for Software Engineering Daily yourself, we are looking for engineers and journalists and hackers who want to work with us on content. This is a paid opportunity. We pay $300 for shows that we publish uh, you can go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash host to find out more. We do have a high quality bar, but we walk you through the process. So if, if you're eager to publish material to build your personal brand or to just do some journalism, we want to be your podcasting back end. And the Software Engineering Daily store is now open. If you want to buy a branded t-shirt or hoodie or a mug and support the show, it would be great. We'd get some money out of it. So... You can go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash store to find that store and buy some stuff. Now let's get on with the show. For more than 30 years, DNS has been one of the fundamental protocols of the internet. Yet, despite its accepted importance, it has never quite gotten the due that it deserves. But today's dynamic applications, hybrid clouds, and volatile internet demand that you rethink the strategic value and importance of your DNS choices. Oracle Dyn provides DNS that is as dynamic and intelligent as your applications. Dyn DNS gets your users to the right cloud service, the right CDN, or the right data center using intelligent response to steer traffic based on business policies as well as real-time internet conditions like the security and the performance of the network path. Dyn maps all internet pathways every 24 seconds via more than 500 million trace routes. This is the equivalent of 7 light years of distance, or 1.7 billion times around the circumference of the Earth. With over 10 years of experience supporting the likes of Netflix, Twitter, Zappos, Etsy, and Salesforce, Dyn can scale to meet the demand of the largest web applications. Get started with a free 30-day trial for your application by going to dyn.com slash sedaily. That's D-Y-N dot com slash S-E daily. After the free trial, Dyn's developer plans start at just $7 a month for world-class DNS. Rethink DNS. Go to Dyn dot com slash S-E daily to learn more and get your free trial of Dyn DNS. Jeff Ralston is a partner at Y Combinator. Jeff, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me, Jeff. You wrote a blog post called Hacking DNA, the story of CRISPR, Ken Thompson, and the gene drive. Why did you write this article? Well, uh, I have been fascinated by uh, synthetic biology in general, um, sort of the merger of, of biotechnology and software engineering for uh, for a while, um, for several years, I, I sort of had a, a, an epiphany one evening when I when I couldn't sleep and 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 realized that the the programming of the human and indeed any genome was maybe not imminent but but coming soon, and that the results of that were going to be staggering and important. And um, and when I when I learned about CRISPR, I, I realized it was. It was a, um, it was one of the key missing pieces that was going to accelerate 
uh, that technology and that future that it was going to impose on the human race <laughs> pretty pretty rapidly. Um, then uh, I learned about Gene Drive and and Kevin Esfeldt's work on Gene Drive, and it just reminded me of this of this incredible hack that Ken Thompson did, and so it just felt like something that needed to be written. And I felt like even though there'd been a, a bunch of really good jobs done um, talking about um, uh, CRISPR and what it meant, I, I just think didn't think it was really in people's consciousness yet. And I think it's so important, so transformative that I wanted to do everything I could to um, to help it be better known that this, that this uh, I think, impending change for humanity was lurking out there <laughs> and there just wasn't enough conversation about it. And I just wanted to uh, make, you know, just help help make that conversation happen, I guess. You're not a professional biologist, but <laughs> Far you from see, it. well, I mean, you see a lot of cutting edge science at Y Combinator. And I think, you know, part of the job of a venture capitalist is to assess things that are somewhere in between research and go to market viable products. And there's a continuum between those things. And you never want to be. You never want to be too far on the side of research where it's like, okay, like quantum computing, probably like quantum computing five or six or t maybe 10 years ago, or maybe even today, I honestly am not up to date with quantum computing, but that's something where 10 years ago we could have talked about quantum computing, but the the ways that quantum computing is going to impact uh, the world and the pace at which it's going to do that is you know less clear and you probably wouldn't have been made you know made good money investing in quantum computing 10 years ago and and it takes you know it, it takes a venture capitalist mindset to perhaps translate those the state of science into the viability of that science having an effect on the broader world yeah you know there's a um there's a famous investor who responded to the question um uh, you know, what's the secret to your success by saying that he always sold too soon. I think the, um, one of the secrets to startup investing is to always invest too soon. <laughs> I know that's, that's a little contradictory, but it is true that you have to sort of get a little bit ahead. Now, the, 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 the harsh fact is if you really invest too soon in a technology, if you invest in quantum computing 10 years ago, you're probably going to lose your money because a company can do great work, but if there's no market or the, the technology just isn't ready, they'll run out of money and the, the company will probably fail. So you want to be sort of too soon but ironic, like not really too soon, just a little bit before everyone else so that the technology has a chance to flourish at the right moment in time for for everything to come together, the market, the the viability, etc. But by the way, we at YC, we, we did invest in quantum computing, but not 10 years ago, two years ago with this incredible company called Rigetti. And, um, and we're really excited about the work they're doing. Yeah, they just raised a big Series A. They did, yeah. And it's funny because it seems like there's not really, you know, when you think about it, what are the technologies today that resemble quantum computing 10 years ago? It's kind of, I mean, what are they? I mean, maybe it's like, um, you know, interplanetary transport. Like you can't, you can't invest in interplanetary transport today because you have no idea what that market is really going to, or maybe you can, I don't, I guess I don't, I don't know the deal flow well enough at YC to know that, but it's kind of, I don't know, it might be a sign of the pace of technology that it's hard, you know, 10 years ago, you could have said, okay, quantum computer is going to impact something or genetic editing is going to impact something at some point in the distant future, but we can't really invest in it today. Today, it's like, Okay, the future is it, it seems closer and judging <laughs> by the fact that you can't really you can't really think of an investment that is implausible today. You know one of uh, I think that's actually incredibly well said that the future is closer. <laughs> the future, you know, one of the um the effects of that is have you noticed how mainstream science fiction is now? Yeah. Uh, I, can, I mean, I, can, I don't even read. I don't. Even, I used to read science fiction. Now I don't even read it. I just read the news. It's, it's really true, right? You know, um, the but it used to be for 
geeks like me who let you know science fiction was this this you know little corner of the world that was ours forget that right it science fiction is is everyone saying i think it's because the future is so close like what can you talk about that that we're not quite ready to invest in maybe space elevators not quite ready <laughs> we don't but uh, maybe asteroid mining although people are starting to invest in asteroid mining so maybe it's not quite too late or too early for that. So, um, you know, you, you might have said neural interfaces uh, uh, about <laughs> three months ago, but apparently that's not too early to invest in. And, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the ability for people to take science fiction and <clears throat> turn it into science fact uh, with incredible rapidity is is stunning now i think it's 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 you know it's alvin toffler all over again it's the theme of our world it's future shock the future is closer it's here now and it's moving ever ever more quickly closer to us right the the it's it's hard to escape and i i you know this is a bit of a, a tangent but i personally think that one of the reason it feels like such a disruptive age in sort of every sense, not just in science and technology and investing, but in politics is is a function of that effect, the fact that people feel unsure about their future and unsure about what comes next. And, and that causes incredible nervousness and disruption and change. And we see it all around us now. I, I, it seems like it's an unavoidable facet of our time. Yeah. And, you know, uh, not to further us down this tangent, but, you know, this morning, it's like, you know, I opened up Hacker News and at the top of Hacker News was some API for uh, for replicating a voice. You know, it's just like where you can give it a small sample of somebody's voice uh, and and you can just you know you can replicate that voice saying whatever you want and i see that and i'm like uh, now i need to like do i need to email my family and tell them hey be on the lookout for scams uh, uh, where it's you know sounds like somebody's voice that you're familiar with it except they're saying weird stuff like i actually am going to have to send an email to my parents to say you have to watch out for for this kind of scam it's like and it's just like when I see these kinds of new technologies, you know, sometimes it just raises my anxiety because I think of the worst case scenario. It, it's so funny. You know, if you think of the um, the way of, I was just saying how the way science fiction turns into science fact. Um, remember, the, like the original Star Trek, when, you know, they they went back in time and saw a future. I think the, I think the, the, the episode was, you know. Kirk and McCoy and one other maybe Spock go back in time and they're trying to save the world and there's there's this guy there who 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 was in our time but has advanced technology because he's really an alien and he's dictating to a typewriter which seemed you know like he's talking to it and it would type it's like wow that's so amazing but you know not so much and 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 I just want to relate that to to what you just pointed out remember in the ter original Terminator movie you know, from 20 oh, yeah. oh, years yeah. ago, where he yep. mimics the voice of, you know, her mom or whomever. That's just the technology you just talked about. That's all it is, is, is you know, and so why wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, an Android be able to do it? All they need is that little module <laughs> that you just talked about, and they can sound like you. And, you know, it's really, you know, uh, you think about security in this modern age, and it's kind of terrifying, right? It's It's kind of terrifying that... You know, you, you set yourself up with two-factor authentication and you start to feel good because you got your phone and you carry it with you everywhere you go and you know that if you want to log into Gmail, it's going to text you and, you know, you're okay. Except then you find out that uh, it's really pretty easy to steal someone's phone number, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. There's, uh, there's actually like two or three different mechanisms you can use to either steal someone's phone number, steal their text, whatever. Right. So that's not that safe. and. Then they could steal your phone number and your voice yes. and have all this information about you. They could tell you, oh, no, it's me. Here's my social security number. Here's the addresses, the last four addresses I've lived, which is all more or less publicly available. It's yeah. kind of, it's a, it's stunning and scary. You just, yeah. the, the fact of the matter is you want to, not, like, the best thing to do is not be a target because <laughs> if they come after That's you, right. you're in trouble. That's right. It is a social pressure to, um, 
well, I guess not be a target, whatever that means. I mean, I, I did I did a show with pin drop security, and it is comforting to know that there are some technologists who are working on this really hard, all the different vulnerabilities in the voice area. Yeah, but it just makes me, you know, I think all of us are still living in denial. Yeah, and, um, in a vulnerable state. I, I mean, I need to, I need to get a YubiKey. <laughs> I need, to, right. I need to, I, and I haven't, and I, I need to, I shouldn't even be saying that on a podcast, right? Because like, there's too many people who listen to this. It's scary, right? It's, it's, we're, we're this isn't exactly the topic we're going to talk about, but, but, um, but it's scary. Spring is a season of growth and change. Have you been thinking you'd be happier at a new job? If you're dreaming about a new job and have been waiting for the right time to make a move, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily today. Hired makes finding work enjoyable. Hired uses an algorithmic job matching tool in combination with a talent advocate who will walk you through the process of finding a better job. Maybe you want more flexible hours or more money or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Zillow or Squarespace or Postmates or some of the other top technology companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You and your skills are in high demand. You listen to a software engineering podcast in your spare time, so you're clearly passionate about technology. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $600 signing bonus from Hired when you find that great job that gives you the respect and the salary that you deserve as a talented engineer. I love Hired because it puts you in charge. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily. And thanks to Hired for being a continued, long-running sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. You know, human bodies are big computers, and our genetic code is similar to binary the main difference is that humans invented the comp the compilation of binary so we can encode and decode things in binary we can compress we can encrypt with the human genome we actually have to reverse engineer the decoding and encoding process the nucleotide sequences how much progress have we made in our understanding of how these coded nucleotide sequences translate to the higher level organic function that we uh, that we'd like to be able to control and engineer? Yeah. Um, so the big caveat here is, um, is I'm not a biologist and I'm, <laughs> I'm far from expert in, in these fields and um, uh, you know, the cool thing is, and I really recommend is you grab someone like Jennifer Doudna or, or, um, or Jennifer uh, Doudna. Okay. I'll, I'll add or, that to my Fang list. Fang Zhang, you know, the people who, who really invented CRISPR and, and, right. and, and you, and, 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 and they'll do a better job of answering this question. And it's actually funny that, um, you know, whenever you like software people start, start talking about biology, it kind of pisses biologists off. And it, you know, some of the comments to, to my post were, were, were a little bit angry because there's so much simplification. Like you have no idea. You got the metaphor wrong. You, you think that, you know, you software people think it's a simple matter of programming and the incredible complexity of protein folding and, and the, the expression of, of genes and um, the interaction with the environment. It's nothing like you think in your little digital minds, in your silicon substrates. It's not that way in the squishy, um, wet world of biology. And they're, of course, right, but I think that they're also, they're also kind of missing the larger picture because for me, um, I mean, the answer to your question is, uh, you know, the, we've made incredible progress and we're not very far along. Right? <laughs> there's, there's like, it, it, you know, I, I, the example I use in the, um, in the essay was, you know, what happens when we can hack intelligence? If you, if you as a parent could choose to increase 
the um, the IQ of your child by 10 points? Would you do it? And um, and the fact is, we have not that much knowledge about IQ and how that relates to the genome or potential environmental factors. It's incredibly complex and it will take a while. But my point is that it's still a, um, it's merely a problem of difficulty. It's hard, but it's solvable. And it's, um, the more you have technologies like CRISPR, the more tools you have in your tool chest to learn about the problem and figure out what it means. You can, uh, without experimenting on human beings, by the way, you can, you, the way we, the way we learn so much about humanity without doing unethical experiments is we can, we can experiment with animals and look at mice and see what sort of improvements in intellectual capacity we can make by editing the genome of, of, of mice or other animals. And eventually we will, we will figure that out. It's not, and I guess that's my main message here to all the biologists who are already pissed off at me for not understanding their field is that it doesn't matter. It's inevitable that we will make progress and that, um, I, I like, I find it extremely unlikely that there's sort of unsolvable problems in how genes are expressed. It is a code. It is repeatable. <laughs> the experiments are repeatable and we will gain the knowledge. It's merely like we in programming, we say it's a simple matter of programming here. It is too, but it's a matter of time and programming. <laughs> you just, you're going to need time. And it's different than the non-determinism of the uh, atomic level, I think. Like maybe that's maybe that's the investment that yeah, you we're not make dealing with right quantum now. mechanics here, we're, right? And and by the way, quantum mechanics is pretty damn deterministic <laughs> in an indeterministic way. Like the the predictions that quantum mechanics makes are incredibly reliable, and and that's why the macro world is so deterministic. By the way, <laughs> it, that the, that reliability gives us the determinism of the right. macro world. Right, the macro world, including the lower levels of biology that we're getting into. So Absolutely. Uh, so CRISPR stands for it's an acronym, C R I S P R. It stands for clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And this is the editing technology that as you say gives unprecedented power to genetic engineers. And CRISPR itself refers to these repeated clusters of these strange nucleotide sequences in DNA. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a mis... Like, the whole labeling... I mean, it's kind of a cool name, CRISPR, but, like, it's a... Like, CRISPR, as I point out in the essay, is not real... It doesn't really refer to the editing technology. It right. just refers to these... 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 Um, uh, these nucleotides that are repeated in, <laughs> in, um, in originally in viral DNA, which was really just a clue on the path to discovering the editing technology, which uses, right. which uses these enzymes called the, these Cas enzymes. So really, the technology is CRISPR Cas, right? Together, yeah. putting those two, those two concepts together. Um, and I don't guess no one came up with a better name than CRISPR, so we all call it CRISPR. But that that so that that weird that weird acronym, which will you know I think someday be completely forgotten because who cares that they're regularly interspaced or that they're short or that they're palindromic? It just doesn't matter. So, so CRISPR these these uh, clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats of DNA. This was originally found in bacterial DNA. Explain why this encoding sequence indicated something that was actually quite useful for the bacteria. What was their useful function? Yeah. You know, it all goes back to this incredible epic battle being fought on a daily, hourly, um, by the minute and second, um, this, this battle between bacteria and phages, which are viruses that attract bacteria. You know, bacteria were, were all there. They were the only life game in town for 2 billion years before there was multicellular cellular life. So the, during that time, there was still evolution and, and viruses and viruses would attack um, 
bacteria and bacteria developed defense mechanisms and and it turns out that CRISPR was one of those defense mechanisms. This guy, Eugene Coonan, kind of, in my understanding, is that he had the first insight. You know, these 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 clustered repeats, these CRISPR repeats, were discovered in bacterial DNA long ago by these Japanese researchers, but they didn't know what they were for. And Coonan kind of said, "I think they're a defense mechanism." And it turns out that that bacteria have developed a rudimentary uh, um, immune system. And even though CRISPR is very sophisticated, it turns out, you know, our immune system is incredible, right? We have, we have armies. They don't quite have that. But what they do have is the ability to recognize certain invaders and to attack them and kill them, essentially. If you can think of it, and it's a weird, we're, we're talking uh, terms that, perhaps suffer from a lack of real accuracy because I don't know if you can talk about killing a virus. I don't even know what, because it's not really alive, but they're making it, they're rendering it inactive. And so, so it turns out that the, what bacteria can do is chop up a virus, take its DNA and put, and by the way, virus and phage, I'll use interchangeably and put that DNA into its own DNA sequence. And using these Cas enzymes, it can grab that DNA, put it into like this package with RNA, go wandering around its, its cell. And if it bumps into DNA that matches, these Cas enzymes have molecular scissors that chop up that DNA and kill it, essentially. So what a cool defense mechanism. It just turns out that that defense mechanism, that, that chop chop that it does is basically what you need to do to edit DNA. And it was that is these, you know, again, this brilliant insight by by um, folks like Jennifer Doudna and and um, and Emmanuel Charpentier at Berkeley and Feng Zhang at at the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT that figured this out and mm. and created CRISPR. And by the way, they're all creating CRISPR companies now, <laughs> which is really? really fascinating. Oh yeah, they're all they've they, you know there's public CRISPR companies already, oh. and they're they're. Um, they're all like sort of in, in, in essence in competition with one another to commercialize this technology. It's going to be an epic battle of its, of, of its own <laughs> um, to, to see who, who manages to, um, to really commercialize. Surely this. not a winner take all battle. I would, you know, I would think not. I, I mean, it, it's a little sad for me, I guess that it's, that it's, um, an intellectual property battle. I think intellectual property has, has, has uh, unfortunately, although it's been an incredible thing for innovation, can be a real break in innovation. But CRISPR, this sort of editing technology, it kind of feels to me like like VI. Although people have complained, it's nothing like VI, but it feels to me like something that like anyone should just be able to use it <laughs> to to do what you know if you to do whatever you want. And and maybe it's sort of that way, but there, people are are. Or issue the the U.S. Patent Office is issuing patents. They issued one already, um, and there's a battle between sort of the Berkeley folks and the Broad folks, oh, and the Broad folks wow. won the first first round. And they were all working on this company Editas together, which is a public company. But now Dobna has split off and founded her own company, and Charpentier has split off and found her own company. And so, um, and so we'll see. We'll see what happens, but mm. you know, one of the things is people. One of the things that happens when you form companies is that people start to pour money into them, and and you know that means that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, that you, we're going to start to see things happen. There, right. there are companies well, being formed. I need to do more shows in the in the in the legal area because. I mean, this is sort of like the same question. I mean, well, similar question. I don't want to say the same because we'll see what the court proceedings bear out. But it's like a similar question to the self-driving stuff. Like, d to what degree did Uber steal the LiDAR technology? And to what degree is this stuff just like common knowledge at this point where, uh, I don't know. I mean, th these seem like related questions. Um, totally. I mean, think about think about look what's happening. Like, voice is another great example where that happened. Right there was Nuance who owned everything and Microsoft who owned everything and there was these epic battles. There was ba they were even back when I was at Yahoo, there was a battle, um, actually just after I left, where folks we had hired to to look at voice from Nuance and there's that had intellectual property issues and there were suits and 
that these are some of the, the core technologies that are going to drive the future. There's going to be amazing battles around each and every one of them, from self-driving to, you know, augmented terrain. There were around search back in the day, and there will be around CRISPR, and there will be around every one of these um, these transformative technologies, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of can of worms opening up here, and I need to do some other shows around different topics, but just so, so the listeners get an overview of what CRISPR is. Um, so you mentioned this this process of a bacteria is, you know, there's a, this never-ending war between bacteria and bacteriophages, and the bacteria, in order to have a self-defense mechanism against the bacteriophage, chops up the DNA of a virus that it has defeated and it inserts it into its own DNA so that it can use it as a template to recognize viruses in the future. Exactly. And the, the, the technology that we can build around this is essentially we repurpose this, this, this uh, labeling and cutting mechanism uh, and it, the labeling, cutting, and insertion mechanism to be able to edit it generic so this is generically applicable we can apply this to human dna and um and basically any anything any any sort of animal um well that's like that's sort of like the epiphany i had way back when which was that if you think about it almost every living thing starts from exactly the same point you have a cell which is at least in the animal kingdom pretty much identical with a slightly different code on the inside. And the result of that code is a radically different machine, which, by the way, sort of self-manufactures itself um, in every case. And the variety of machines it can create is extraordinary from human beings and the human brain, which is the most complex device we know about in the universe thus far, to tiny flying machines and large flying machines. It's it's amazing. And that code is editable by, in, in essentially, to my understanding, every case by CRISPR. We have been given this incredible tool to allow us to essentially make that code whatever we want. Now, we don't necessarily have the knowledge yet to be able to make it things that are useful and useful can be thought very broadly. Useful could be something dangerous and horrible or useful can be something wonderful. Um, but um, just to do something that matters is a little bit beyond our capability in every, mm. in every case. But we do know a lot of things that we can do with this, with editing technology. We know that we know, for example, we know a whole bunch of diseases that are determined by single gene errors. That's sort of a piece of cake mm. for um, for CRISPR. And mm. when you find things like you can determine which genes confer immunity to diseases, for example, HIV, you could edit that and create that. Or, for example, um, if you know what genes are the ones that make solid cancers immune to our immune system, <laughs> allow them to fight off our immune system. And you can change those. You can then allow our immune system to defeat the cancer. Right. These are all real applications of CRISPR that we're going to see in the, in the short term. The, the, um, the ability of CRISPR to be broadly applicable, I think, is its most extraordinary feature. And broadly applicable in, in 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 multiple dimensions in the set of uh, of different organisms in which it works from mosquitoes to human beings, and the set of applications within each of those organisms that it can apply to. Now, CRISPR itself only allows for modifications of one gene at a time, one organism at a time. If we wanted to do what you call a species level change, we need additional technology. I explain why that is. I believe what you said is not quite correct, that you could actually okay. use CRISPR to modify multiple genes at a time. Um, but 
the 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 limitation, if you want to call it a limitation, mm. is that is that just changing those genes in in you, for example. Um, let's say you suffer from um, macular degeneration, and that's a genetically predicated disease, and that we can fix that by going into your eye, by placing CRISPR into your eye and changing all the the DNA in your retina to no longer have that gene and therefore no longer express whatever gets expressed to cause macular degeneration. Unfortunately, if your children, uh, if you have chil- if you subsequently have children, they'll still have that gene. Um, and because the, the 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 DNA in your in your eyeball does not get passed along to your to future generations. However, if you if you use CRISPR to change um, the um, either sperm or eggs, then you actually can affect future generations, and that is something that CRISPR can do. Um, the the reason I brought up gene drive is because uh, it it just makes the impact. It's it's a multiplier on the impact because if if you change your reproductive DNA, the DNA in your sperm, to to to, to do something different, it it only has a fifty percent chance in each subsequent generation of being expressed in your uh, being present in in your offspring. Gene drive changes those odds essentially and um and the gene drive that um kevin asphalt created essentially can get that close to 100 percent um and there's a lot of complexity there as to as to how effective it can be and and the the (laughs) and and as again biologists will point out the biology is complicated and there's 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 ways that that um that a, a a crispr created gene drive can can run into into barriers, but those I think are are again amenable to to rigorous hard work to overcome. And what that means is that you can get characteristics, genetically derived characteristics, to spread throughout a population with startling rapidity. Um, probably won't be used so much in human beings as it will be in in other species that reproduce more rapidly, like mosquitoes. Uh, for example, which was the where where asphalt was was first experimenting, so that you could, for example, create a mosquito population that could no longer carry malaria. Right. So I, I understand what you're saying, and um, and again, I, I I I'll forgive you if you uh, if you don't know the answer to this question. I clearly need <laughs> to have some some people who are total experts in this field on the show. I actually yes. think it's a good. It's a, you know. Side note. I actually think it's a good. When I start to do a series of shows, I actually I think it's sometimes good to start with a non-expert, like somebody that's just sort of an external ex- observer, because they're a little better at bridging the gap between the layman and the uh, advanced shows. Uh, so, so I think this actually makes a lot of sense. But tell me. By tell the me way, you, by the way, it's especially hard in in um, in biology and biotechnology because if you talk to folks, it's it's very easy to get lost in the in the, <laughs> in not just the terminology because you know everyone is jargon. But there's right. Lots and, lots and lots of jargon and lots and lots and lots of acronyms. But it, it is actually incredibly complex how this stuff works. And right. You know, well, I, I, I mean, it's very I, useful I, I, to pull back, but there is this these underlying levels of complexity that it's you're right. It's sometimes helpful not even to know about. <laughs> I fully understand how if you change the the at the sperm or the egg level, you change the DNA, and then it and then mitosis takes care of replicating the change to DNA as time goes on in the organism, and then it's also changed in the offspring of that organism. But if I'm a fully grown human and my phenotype includes some kind of macular degeneration, I think that's the term. Uh, like, how do you change the gene? Or how do you change all of the cells in my eye with CRISPR? Do you like spray my eye with the CRISPR juice, or do you have to insert something, or is it a surgical procedure? Is there is there a way to to do that in a in a fully developed human? Yeah, uh, and people are developing them right now. Uh, the, the I think the question you're asking is, what's the delivery mechanism? <laughs> right, and people are developing those as we speak. We're actually. Um, funding companies <laughs> that are creating delivery mechanisms at YC. So it's a good question. How do you get the CRISPR inside the gene? But um, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'm not an expert at that, but I will leave it <laughs> okay. to say that, that 
you might as well think about it as spraying the eye with CRISPR. <laughs> and and it gets inside the cells and does its stuff. And there are definitely um, ways to do that. Um, there are ways to get uh, um, chemicals, enzymes, um, packages across cell barriers. And once you do that, there are ways, you know, th then it can it can go do its stuff. So yeah, there, there are ways to get CRISPR inside. Um, and, and that wasn't a made-up case. People are trying to 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 create CRISPR systems that will um, that will correct things like macular degeneration. Of course, you know it would be better if you could if it if it was indeed a genetic disease that you just got rid of it first before <laughs> it's in your DNA. And that's why um, changing the DNA of um, of you know, that's undergone meiosis is the, in the sperm or the egg can make sense, but it's ethically incredibly challenging, right? Where, where exactly is the consent to modify the, the DNA of a person that isn't born yet? And, you know, a couple of Chinese researchers did some experiments on human embryos using CRISPR and indeed um, changed the DNA in a way that it would have been, um, it had those embryos, they were non-viable embryos, so there was never any possibility of this, but had the embryos been viable and had they grown into human beings, their DNA would have been generational DNA and those changes would have been generational. And it was very controversial, even though they were non-viable, just because, you know, there's all sorts of questions. Consent is, is one of them about, about whether it's ethical to change the genome of a, of a, of a, human being before they're a human being. And uh, and I think those are complex questions. I actually, in one sense though, think it from the perspective and uniquely from the perspective of whether the technology goes forward and whether people try that or not, it doesn't matter. People will try it. I think, and that doesn't mean that the ethical considerations don't matter. I think they're incredibly important, but, but like I, it, the the Pandora's box has been opened, and it's very hard to contain a technology like this once it's out there. And so I, I think it would be very naive for us to think that that um, whatever whatever ethical restraints we put on ourselves will be enforced. Well, many elsewhere. of those many of those questions are going to be sidestepped because there's plenty of things that you can do with people who have some horrible genetic malady that they're willing to do any sort of experimentation i mean this is that, that that's in the post developed uh human being area of things but you know even if you're talking about the developmental side of things the or the gene drive uh, experiments that you would want to be doing on an on an embryo it doesn't even have to be a human i mean you can do this kind of stuff on a a monkey embryo or on a mouse embryo and and right. you know it's not right. like that it's not like that totally sidesteps the ethical questions but it at least reduces the uh the passion around them to a level that's not at the uh, abortion abortion level controversy it, it, case in point i believe the the those chinese researchers had something like a 28 percent hit rate in other words their 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 CRISPRization of these embryos failed seventy-two percent of the time, Ugh. which sounds pretty bad. Although getting twenty-eight percent to work is is something. I mean, you know, if if you're doing IVF, that 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 rate sounds about right. But but further advances in their techniques were tried in mouse embryos, and my understanding is they were one hundred percent accurate, one hundred percent successful. So, <clears throat> so you know the science is advancing all the time and and incredibly rapidly. And I think the hardest thing to keep track of will be the set of things that CRISPR is being used for. There's going to be thousands of applications. Hmm. Um, CRISPR can be used, as I was saying before, on disease vectors. CRISPR can be used potentially as a, a kind of um, ant, you know super antibiotic. CRISPR can be used to fight cancer. Um, CRISPR could be used to create biofuels and to create more efficient crops or 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 crops that uh, have defense mechanisms against uh, disease their own disease vectors. So the, uh, like just keeping track like once you have an editing tech it's sort of it's sort of like 
you know, software, trying to keep track of all the things you can do with software. Right. Because once you can edit the software, you know, it, it, it goes from the set of things that you can research as a biotechnologist uh, for your PhD has just expanded many, many fold. Likewise, the set of companies you can create and the set of um, things you can, that are approachable now that were never approachable before, or solvable, is extraordinary. That's why right. it's such an important technology and has been recognized as, as so transformative. But I just, you know, I think it's a sort of separate orthogonal to all that will be that someone's going to try to change human beings with this in, in fundamental ways. You know, I just think there's this theme. Um, uh, Yuval Harari has written about this, I think, um, eloquently in... in um, in, in Homo Deus, cities, but especially in Homo Deus, oh right, about the fact that that um, that we we might I, I don't know if you have kids I do but th it might sort of be the last generation yeah. of Homo sapiens the way we think of Homo sapiens there's this there's these three forces that are going to I think change humanity forever and one is CRISPR and one is AI and mm -hmm. the other is human augmentation which is. Mm -hmm which is kind of connected. And, you know, this is a train that has left the station. This uh -huh. is going to happen. And, I, you know, I tell my kids, you're, you're like, you have, you are living in probably the most interesting time, incredible time ever. You may be able to achieve immortality. You yeah. may be able to change your bodies and your children in ways that had never been thought of before. Well, it's probable and, at this point. And, it, it, you know, and it's, I think the only argument might be whether it's, whether it's this generation or the next generation. You know, what, what it, are we talking 10 years, 20 years, or 50 years? I don't know. But... But the um, that's, that, the time frames are not long. Yeah, and I mean that's why, like, frankly, I'm just not really even thinking. I mean, when I talk to people about having kids or not, I mean, I'm just sort of like it's kind of a moot point. Like that's sort of like, sure. <laughs> I mean, there it would be fun to have kids, and it would also be fun to just have complete independence as we begin to explore this crazy frontier. But in any case, it doesn't really matter because even the the idea of of individual human beings is going to be a moot point in like thirty to fifty years. Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not sure. I, I know what that means, and I, I think you know. Um, you know, one of the points that Harari makes is that it. You know, it it's sort of like um, pre humans chimpanzees or, right. or gorillas trying to imagine how we approach problems and what 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 sort of things we're solving for us to try to imagine what the the next set of thinking beings is, are going to be preoccupied with but um but i don't know that that there's there's any like some things i find are inevitable like i, I find it inevitable that that these changes we've been talking about will happen. I don't know that it's inevitable that we'll lose the concept of individuality. Hmm. You know, the the reason is is that that still one of the deepest mysteries is um the one of consciousness. Right. And you know, I suspect that you know, we were talking about sort of how the complexity of biology and I I find it hard to imagine that there's complexities of biology that are not amenable to to human intellectual um, approaches and understanding, so yeah. that, that that we can open them up. I, I don't I don't think that's so likely. It's possible, but I don't think it's so likely. But consciousness, you know, there might be unknowables there. I, I don't know that that because there's this subjective quality to it that might be difficult to get at, and it just might be true that 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 um that we'll be able to know everything there is to know about consciousness and that and that and maybe ai will be will help us figure that out if we can create consciousness on a different substrate than on a brain then we'll probably understand it fairly well that being said we don't even understand why deep learning does what it does so i'm, I'm not it's not so obvious to me that human beings in our current intellectual capacity can, We'll be able to do that. I mean, we we might just run run into limits that we don't understand yet. But 
consciousness and individuality are obviously tightly intertwined. And whether we have to, whether it's inevitable that we, we have to let go of that individuality, even just because we're connected in a much more tight, tightly um, understood fashion to other consciousnesses isn't so clear to me. Do you want the flexibility of a non-relational key value store together with the query capabilities of SQL? Take a look at C-TreeAce by Faircom. C-TreeAce is a non-relational key value store that offers ACID transactions complemented by a full SQL engine. C-TreeAce offers simultaneous access to the data through non-relational and relational APIs. Companies use C-TreeAce to process ACID transactions through non-relational APIs for extreme performance while using the SQL APIs to connect third-party apps or query the data for reports or business intelligence. C-TreeAce is platform and hardware agnostic, and it's capable of being embedded, deployed on-premises, or in the cloud. Faircom has been around for decades, powering applications that most people use daily. Whether you are listening to NPR, shipping a package through UPS, paying for gas at the pump, or swiping your Visa card in Europe, Faircom is powering you through your day. Software Engineering Daily listeners can download an evaluation version of C-TreeAce for free by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash faircom. Thanks to Faircom C-TreeAce for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and you can go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash faircom to check it out and support the show. I wonder sometimes, like, how much of this kind of stuff can I talk about? Because it's almost like one of these things, you know, it's like that, that Paul Graham piece, what you can't say. It's like, can you can you even talk about this stuff at the dinner table these days, right? That, you know, at the Thanksgiving dinner table without making people, like, really upset and uncomfortable that you're questioning the nature of humanity in this lifetime um so how that's i mean i think i think that goes back to the 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 point i was making earlier that people are getting nervous right i just think that uh, you know and, and it's maybe a step too far but i think if you look at from brexit to trump to to the recent french election yeah the the way populations are just like you know people are freaking nervous. out People are freaking out, and and I really do think so. I think that, you know, I, I sort of felt in 2008 during the financial crisis that sort of one of the fundamental underpinnings of the world that I had sort of I made some assumptions about <laughs> like that that it was like that they kind of knew what they were doing. Efficient like markets, like like it was all kind of like, and I realized that that's not so much, and I, I and there was this unsettling that happened right it's like that could happen again like what's stopping it like we're just going and going you know the, we haven't gotten really any smarter we're not you know we're just we're, we're just going to do some regulations and then a bunch of people say oh those regulations suck we need to get rid of them and we'll get rid of those regulations and and we'll be there again it's the same thing right people are nervous and freaking out and and i i think you know i think you can have these conversations and people don't quite know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. Like when you tell people, oh yeah, this is like, this could be the last generation of human beings, which <laughs> sounds like, you know, that's that's like the guy walking around with the placard saying the end is near. Yeah. Like, like that's crazy talk. And it might be maybe not crazy talk, but not this, like it could be wrong, but but it's not wrong for long. So I, I, do, I think people like, like normally when when people act crazy and say crazy things it makes people nervous and 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 there's enough people saying them now that they're really nervous <laughs> cuz who knows you know you know the sky might just be falling yeah so it almost doesn't matter like how you personally are updating your societal norms it's more like um just like how do you st i mean it's almost like uh, this explains like the prepper phenomenon or people talking about prepping and it's just like there's some crazy stuff going on and, it, and well, it's well look here's the thing here's the thing and uh, i and um you know i was thinking about this as i was reading um homo days and and you know he, early on he has this 
discussion about like what happens when you know as you get to this new level of humanity and you you can start to think about populating the galaxy mm -hmm. right you can i mean you can yeah you it, and it you know the the math is such that it doesn't even take that long that once you start being able like if you can imagine a silicon substrate or you can imagine humanity being able to to to, to take a whole bunch of different steps interstellar travel is is not beyond us if you talk about you know time frames that sound crazy now but like if you talk about it, hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years but this begs the incredibly important question that Enrico Fermi asked right <laughs> which is where are they all where is everybody why haven't we seen anyone because we're not that young in the, in the universe the universe has been around for 14 billion years right and so if this is sort of a natural evolution and life is common how come other folks hasn't haven't sort of spread out throughout the galaxy or if they have how come we've never met them or how come they're hiding from us or or maybe there there isn't anyone so either i mean there's a there's a few assumptions you have to make there but maybe the most popular is that there's a great filter right which is that like you make it to this stage and then something bad happens and uh, you know so you know the preppers are, are are maybe they wouldn't put it quite this way but they're they're thinking that there really is a filter for sure <laughs> that something bad's gonna happen, for sure right and and, and it's 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 uh i mean I, I i don't say prepper in in any sort of derogatory term i, I do yeah. think like the when you get to the fermi question you're you're on grounds where it's equally plausible that the others are invisible or they you know completely transcend the you know the the world the world that we can sense or we're in a simulation or any one of these different like things, I think those are all equally plausible. I think probabilistically, if there's lots and lots of life out there, I mean, if life if life actually is um, fairly common in the universe, and that um, and it's not that unusual for technology to be developed, then I think it's quite surprising that we haven't seen any indication of it at all, at all, ever, nothing. Right, essentially, that's surprising to me, and so um, it feels like there, there's something wrong in that equation. <laughs> it just doesn't. Uh, like, I don't. I don't know about plausibility, but it just you know because if that were true, then there would have been very very ancient um, species that would have gotten as far as us and probably would have tried to go out, through, you know, to expand throughout the galaxy well and. Uh, so they probably would have found us. Yeah, but if you, so, if you take a probabilistic, if you're taking a probabilistic mindset, one prob I mean, one conclusion I come to sometimes is like, you know, if you're playing in the simulation uh, realm of um, of possibilities, like, you know, if you just look at humanity and it's like, wow, you know, just like as you're talking to your kids and you're saying today is literally the most exciting time you could live in. Well, if somebody were going to build a simulate, like if 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 a human, if a future world of humans was going to build a simulation uh, to simulate people like us, the most fun simulation would be the reality today, as far as we understand it. Uh, which it could I don't know. It's this gets into uh, <laughs> pretty far removed yeah. stuff. So I don't you know, know. That's you know, for what it's worth, that's kind of my my interpretation of of quantum mechanics mm. is that is is that um it, it, that quantum mechanics for me increases the likelihood that this is a simulation right and, the, and the, what all those probabilities means is just a, a, it's a it's a shortcut it's sort of it's um you know uh it, it's delayed calculation of of um <laughs> of, of things that a software programmer did so that they, they didn't have to you know decide where all the locations were all the time you don't care until you have to care it's just it you know that's why we're in a simulation but right oh well yeah yeah well i mean and, and, uh, yeah okay well so um let's get back to reality as we close off uh this interview so the, you know you are doing some investment in CRISPR. what are the company can you talk about some of the companies that you've invested in well a few uh it turns out that um well i'll, I'll mention i'll mention a couple um a lot of them are, are, are so new like, in our current batch that i can't really talk about sure. um one of the interesting ones is a company called benchling um, and, uh, and Betchling is, is, 
Sajith will kill me for saying this, but they're 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 sort of not they're they're maybe a little on the boring side of CRISPR. They just they they enable CRISPR companies, <laughs> so they're not sort of they're not creating a CRISPR technology, but they 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 help people manage all of their 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 DNA, <laughs> and so they're being used by every CRISPR company. So that's essentially a CRISPR company, but um and that's sort of a, that's core CRISPR infrastructure, if you will. So um and in fact, infrastructure is not at all boring. So I'm sorry, Saji. Um, Perlara is uh, a, another example, and um, they're doing something really fascinating. They take organisms um, that um, that are in important ways have similarities to to human function, and use CRISPR to modify those organisms so that they have rare diseases that appear in human beings. And then they use those organisms to test drug compounds to see what will work on those rare diseases. So that these diseases that are incredibly difficult to deal with, that that people are loath to spend lots of money on because it's so expensive to find drugs for rare diseases, can be much more, if you will, economically approached and and dealt with. Mm. So, um, so that's a really cool company. It's just another way that CRISPR can be used, sort of a, a tangential way, if you will, that CRISPR can be used to help approach diseases that um, that were just not, you know, that w- were tickets to either either a, a foreshortened life, a very difficult life, or um, or really no life at all. So. You know, in the so- pure software realm, AWS has removed a lot of the execution risk that you might have had in in investments in the past, uh, like pre pre AWS era. Uh, is there still a lot of execution risk around the the stuff that CRISPR companies are building on top of? I think it's almost certainly true that the the execute the, the execution risk. Um, that has been. Re- it's important to start with what the execution is that's been removed, that CRISPR has removed, which is that it used to be incredibly time consuming and way too expensive to do the kind of edits that could have substantive impact. And so you had scientists sort of wasting years of their life trying to do this and, you know, sometimes coming up empty and sometimes not getting nearly as far along as they wanted to and, and just huge long periods of time and CRISPR makes it fast cheap accurate easy so that that problem has mostly been solved what hasn't been solved and the and the the real execution risk that still exists is that you know we're talking about for the most part for a lot of these things uh technologies want they want to change human beings um cure human beings, impact human beings. And so you have to go through um, FDA approval and that's still hard and slow and risky. Um, so you have to do you have to do trials, you have to do careful trials because these technologies, you know, have the potential to do harm as well as incredible good. So we want to be the companies will have to be careful. We want a society, a society to be careful. That's why the way by, by the way why Prolara is so genius because um, it, it, it's it's found a way to nuance that so that you can do the drug discovery of drugs that already exist in organisms you don't need to get FDA approval to, to change to CRISPRize those organisms and you can solve disease that way which is really cool so you can you can move very quickly to market but so but you know that that risk that infrastructural risk probably shouldn't go away and and, and hasn't All right, Jeff. Well, thanks for coming on Software Engineering Daily. This was a really great, wide-ranging conversation. I I really enjoyed having you on. Hey, I enjoyed it a lot, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Artificial intelligence is dramatically evolving the way that our world works. And to make AI easier and faster, we need new kinds of hardware and software, which is why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems and its platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop a full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. 
Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for an opening on the team. To learn more about the company, check out the interviews that I've conducted with its engineers. Those are also available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel. Come build the future with Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply now.